Hello everyone, this is Andrew. Welcome to Keen on America. On July 4th, 2026, America will be 250 years old. An anniversary that will, no doubt, be greeted with a mixture of celebration, contemplation and resignation. In Keen on America, we talk to prominent US citizens not just about their country's past and present, but also about its future. What, I ask my American guests, will be the 21st century fate of their now venerable republic? If you're looking for the conscience of American conservatism, you might find it in Peter Weiner, the Atlantic and New York Times columnist, and a persistent moral critic of Donald Trump and Trumpism. So to begin our Keen on America conversation, I asked Pete, a veteran of the Reagan administration, whether he felt any shame in previous episodes of American history. Yeah, in terms of when I look back at American history uh, and the emotions that I have and whether I've feel shame about it. Um, shame would probably be too strong of a, of, 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 of a word, um, but there are elements of American history that are uh, deeply troubling, and they're shameful episodes in American history without, without question. Um, more than I knew growing up. It's, it's interesting, I've thought about this question before, which is, when I studied American history in, in, in uh, junior high and high school and elementary school, um, what were my s memories of it? What did I learn? And I think I, uh, I was brought up educationally on an idealized version of America, uh, not a false version of America, because many of the things you studied when, when I was young uh, were true and spoke well of America, but I just don't think that I had the full full story um, now. And I'd like to think that my sense of America now is more textured and more more nuanced. I'm certainly more aware of the failures that America has 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 had. So I think they're shameful episodes. But you know, uh, with the life of a country is the same as the life of an individual, which is you have to take them in the totality of their acts. And I do think that uh, America, taken to the totality of its acts, its achievements, are pretty, pretty extraordinary, but, but hardly, hardly perfect, that's for sure. Should we historicize morality? I asked Wayne. Can we use our contemporary morality to judge the goodness or evil of previous generations? Yeah. In terms of whether one historicizes uh, morality or whether I do, and this balance between um, objective moral truths, that is truths and moral truths that don't change over time because they're objectively true, then taking into account the degree to which you have to judge individuals um, in the times in which they lived, what the, what the ethos was that they, that they were brought in, up in, uh, what could have reasonably been expected of them? How do you balance those? Um, I think it's a complicated question. I think it's a complicated question because I think um, there's a, probably a tendency uh, that I've experienced in my life to bend over backwards to try and make excuses for uh, people who were engaged in what we would now consider to be immoral acts. Um, slavery is the most obvious example, most conspicuous, but it's not, it's not the only one. And you know, often you hear from people who say, well, that's the way it was done. That's, that's, that's the moral universe in which they, they, were, they were brought up in. Um, so of course they believe the, the, those, uh, those things. That has to be taken into account. No, no one can escape their culture or their ethos uh, or the assumptions uh, and propositions of, of, of a country and of a generation. Um, and so that has to be taken into account. And there are undoubtedly things Andrew, that you and I believe now that 100 years from now, 500 years from now, people are going to look back at and say, how could they have believed those things? How could they have countenanced those, those things? Um, 
And you know, we're not trying to be immoral now. Just maybe that our moral sense is, is, is blocked. We have certain assumptions or things that we don't, we don't know. On the flip side, it can be used just too much as an excuse, as a justification, as a rationalization. Um, and when, for example, in the, in the context of slavery, you have people uh, and you're brutalizing them and you're dehumanizing them and, and you're treating them as property, um, there should be a moral sense in people uh, that that's, that's wrong. And, and then you go through and you read how different people treated their slaves. And did they release them or not? And, you know, there's just a whole series of, of, um, of questions. So honestly, I go back and forth. I, I, I don't want to pretend that, you know, sit, sit here on a moral throne and, and look back at every generation that came before me and said how these people were moral imbeciles. Many of them weren't. They, 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 they cared about integrity. They had honor. They were cour courageous in many ways. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, I don't want to make excuses for them. And because morality is objective in many respects, um, you know, we shouldn't pull our punches too, uh, too much. So I think it's a complicated thing. And it's e easy to fall into one camp or, uh, or the other. I asked Wayner whether he agrees with Martin Luther King's observation that the moral arc of the universe tends, or at least bends, towards justice. Well, Martin Luther King said that the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. I think that's basically correct. I think that if you look at the moral progress and the progress of justice in America from its founding, to today, uh, it's moved imperfectly, fits and starts um, toward uh, toward justice. And I think that our attitudes on matters of race, on indigenous population, the treatment of uh, of women, uh, any number of other issues, child labor laws, and so forth. Yeah, I think we made a lot of progress. Um, that doesn't mean that we haven't slipped also uh, from time to time. And I think America today in, in the era of Trump uh, has, 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 has slipped uh, in, in many important respects. So this goes up and down. But as a general matter, I'd say that, that Martin Luther King Jr. was, was right. I think that the, the moral arc of the universe does bend toward, toward, uh, toward justice. But it's a slow process and it's slower sometimes than we wish it would, uh, than it would be. And Americans, I joked with Wayne, aren't the most patient of people. Huh. Yeah, Americans are not known as a, as a particularly patient people, and that can be good um, because people should be impatient with injustice. I think the danger with being impatient is when it uh, undermines, sabotages prudence, discernment, and, uh, and wisdom, which can, which can, can happen. Um, easily. Um, you know, there is such a thing as revolutionary temperament that people can have, and revolutionary temperaments can, can get people and countries into a lot of trouble. I asked Wayner whether he had a particular calling for politics. What drew him in the 1980s to the Republican Party? My first venture into politics, um, it, it, well, you'd have to disaggregate it a little bit. Uh, my interests in politics go back to when I was a teen or teenager. I just remember having conversations with my parents, particularly my dad, about politics. It fascinated me at the time. Um, I remember, for example, I was a kid at the time, but uh, Henry Kissinger, when he was with the National Security Advisor to Richard Nixon and Secretary of State under Nixon and Ford, he was a, a, a significant figure uh, in the American and international stage. And I remember reading about him and talking to my parents about him. International affairs interested in me. Uh, so did domestic matters. The Vietnam War uh, was, was, had come to, a, come to an end, so there was a lot of intense debates about um, the, the war, whether it was justified or, or not. My favorite class in, as I was growing up was social studies. Uh, my teachers were, were liberal and I was not, not because I had thought particularly carefully about conservatism. I think it was really a product of where my parents were. Um, but those inter I just remember thinking politics was really fascinating. And I think at a relatively early age, I did have a sense 
that politics was important because part of what was central to politics was justice. That isn't all that politics is about, but some core essential of politics is the pursuit of, of, uh, of justice. Uh, political science was my, was my major at University of Washington. I uh, did internships when I was a junior in Olympia, the state capital, and then I came to Washington DC when I was a senior on an internship and I interned with the Center for Strategic International Studies. And uh, this is during the, the uh, Reagan years when Reagan was president. And then my first foray into government, uh, I was about 25 years old uh, and I became a speechwriter for William Bennett, who was then Secretary of Education for Ronald Reagan, pretty prominent cabinet secretary um, at, that, uh, at that time. And um, so my entire career has been involved in politics, broadly understood, whether it's in the arena of so-called think tanks, uh, or, or in government itself, and then today I'm, I'm a writer, uh, an essayist for, for the Atlantic and for the New York Times, writing primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on, on politics, political ideas, matters of uh, morality that we've been talking about. What label, I asked Pete Weiner, would he use to describe his own politics? In terms of the labels that I would have applied to myself, conservative is, is, is what I would have put on, certainly when I was in my 20s, when I, mean, I was working in the Reagan administration at, uh, at that, that point. A lot of the people that I was reading at the time, uh, whether it was individuals like Irving Kristol or James Q. Wilson or Richard John Newhouse, uh, or uh, any number of, of, of other figures, Marty Diamond, um, and, and then writers like George Will, and to some degree William F. Buckley, though Buckley wasn't a huge figure in my own, in my own pilgrimage. I'd say George Will was larger, a little bit later Charles Krauthammer. They were all, to one degree or another, uh, conservatives. And Reagan, of course, himself was a conservative. So I felt very comfortable with the, the meaning and the label of, of conservative. And of course, conservatism has a pedigree that goes, it goes beyond those, those figures who were contemporaries of mine or a generation or two older than me. Uh, but you go back to, to you know, Edmund Burke, of course, was, was, was one of the great influential uh, figures in, in conservatism. And some people say he was one of the founders of conservatism, Michael Oakeshott in a, di in a different, different, uh, different way. So yeah, the um, conservatism to me, as I understood it over time, was something I was, I was comfortable with. And, and today I still consider myself a conservative. And in fact, one of the reasons I've broken with uh, the Republican Party under Trump is because I am a conservative. I think the Republican Party under Trump is not a conservative party. I think sometimes it's in incidentally conservative. But I think at its core, uh, the Republican Party under Trump is populist nationalist, ethnic nationalist, and, uh, and dangerous. And in many respects, uh, cons the Republican Party of today and uh, Donald Trump uh, have sensibilities and dispositions which I think are outright anti-conservative. Weiner was involved in both the Reagan and the George Herbert Walker Bush administrations. Were these the glory years, I asked him, of Republican politics? I think the Reagan years uh, were, uh, if not the glory years of conservatism, pretty close to it, at least modern conservatism, yeah. Uh, you know, conservatism in America, uh, and as it relates to the Republican Party, um, I suppose you, you could look at, at uh, the rise of Barry Goldwater in 64 as an as a important moment. Um, but. I, I was too young to, to be a, a, a fan or even to have followed Goldwater at that time. But I was never particularly attracted to Goldwater um, as, a, as a political um, figure. Um, his message and his approach to things just didn't really resonate um, with me. I think Ronald Reagan was an apotheosis of a kind for conservatism um, for, in several respects. Uh, one was, uh, and I think Reagan probably doesn't get enough credit for this, Reagan was a pretty well-read uh, individual, especially on conservatism. He understood uh, 
philosophically what conservatism was 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 about, and he articulated it pretty powerfully. Um, second is that there was a vision of conservatism that Reagan brought with him, which I think was tied in with his temperament and his disposition, and that was a kind of sunny, optimistic conservatism. Uh, that can be rare. I mean, conservatism has certain impulses and 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 history of of certain pessimism and, and, and even some dark elements to it. And, and Reagan was very different than that. Um, and so I think he, he brought a tone and an outlook and a, and a sensibility to conservatism that it needed, that, that made it more hopeful and more future oriented. And then third, of course, is that he won. I mean, he actually won the presidency. Um, and there have been other presidents who had been to some degree conservative, um, Richard Nixon in some respects, though hardly in all. Um, but Reagan was was a real authentic conservative who who uh, you know won the White House and really uh, inspired an entire generation, including me. I mean, I was a young guy at the at the at the time, uh, and a lot of. Uh, people that I know were, were, were shaped by, by Reagan. I also think, Andrew, that conservatism, as, as I was um, uh, being shaped in my 20s, it was intellectually rigorous. It was about really thoughtful books. I mean, you think about Losing Ground on Welfare or The Naked Public Square on Religion and Public Life or Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind or uh, James Q. Wilson and... Um, and Richard Herdenstein on crime, Irving Kristol uh, as, as, an, as an essayist. Uh, so conservatism, as I was shaped by it in the milieu in which, in which uh, I grew up in, was about serious ideas, serious books, intellectual discussion, Antonin Scalia in terms of the articulating a judicial philosophy um, and, and, and all the rest. Uh, so uh, conservatism, I think was intellectually impressive and there was a sense I would say at that time of real self-confidence among conservatives really saying to, to progressives and the left going to bring it on uh, we we feel like we've thought through uh, these ideas pretty carefully and, and we can have an intellectual discussion um, with you one other thing I want to say about something that I think characterized conservatism to its credit uh, is that uh, conservatism understood the nature of the conflict uh, with the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And Reagan was a fierce critic of communism uh, and describing it in terms of good and evil. And he was lacerated by the left at that time, a warmonger. And, um, and there, was, or there were elements uh, in American history throughout the 20th century, primarily on the left, were quite sympathetic to the Soviet Union and viewed America and, and the Soviet Union through a kind of moral equivalence prism. And I think what we now know is that Reagan was right and the Soviet Union was a wicked empire um, and communism itself was, was, a, was a terrible system. And I think conservatism, uh, in my estimation, can be judged to have been on the right side of that debate and the left uh, not all people on the left, uh, there, there, there were impressive anti-Stalinists on the left, but as a movement in general, I think the left uh, was, uh, didn't, didn't um, conduct itself in a particularly estimable way during, during the Cold War conflict. Not everyone, of course, shares Weiner's optimism about the Reagan years. So I asked him whether there's any truth in the accusations by some critics of the Republican Party that the foundations of Trumpism, particularly the racist foundations, were laid by not just Richard Nixon, but also Ronald Reagan. Did the Republicans make moral mistakes during, during the Reagan years, Bush years, uh, or even before then? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, I would say on the issue of, of race, um, the, the so-called Southern strategy uh, turns out to, to have been uh, a, a pretext, at least in some respects, among some people, a pretext uh, for racial appeals. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, if you listen to the debate about um, 
about the so-called Southern strategy. The arguments that liberals and Democrats made uh, was that the Republicans were making racial, coded racial appeals uh, to the South. Uh, the, 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 the context of that was that Lyndon Johnson had supported the Civil Rights Acts, 64 and 65, and when he did, Johnson said contemporaneously, I've lost the South for Democrats for generations. And he did in, many, in, 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 large, uh, in, in large measure. So what happened was the South, which was the, the, uh, the home of segregationism, um, had been largely democratic. Um, I think Strom Thurmond had been a, a, a Democrat. George Wallace certainly had been a Democrat when he was governor of Alabama. Um, but that began to shift and the South ended up going more and more, more Republican. Um, by the time you got to the late 60s and early 70s, there were not explicit racial appeals for the most part um, that, were, that were being used by Republicans. The question was whether uh, there were code words, states' rights, law and order, and so forth, that, uh, that, that were meant to be a so-called dog whistle. Um, and I, I think when we look back at it historically, there is more evidence to say that that was the case that a lot of people would have admitted at the, at the time. And the reason I mention that is that Lee Atwater gave uh, an interview, and the, the interview took place in 1981, and, yeah, and it was, and it was, uh, it was released years later, um, and somebody was doing a, um, a history, I don't know if it was a history of the Republican Party or a history of Atwater, but in any event, they came across these, the, these recordings by Atwater. Atwater had been, a, a hugely important uh, political strategist in the Republican Party. And he was actually defending Reagan against uh, the charges that these were coded messages to, to, uh, to, to racists. But he, Atwater said that by the time you got to the late 1960s, you couldn't use the N-word and you couldn't make naked racial uh, appeals uh, because it would have been politically um, counterproductive and harmful. And so they began to use certain, certain code words like states' rights, and even to some extent law and order. Now this is Lee Atwater um, making this confession or making this, uh, making this acknowledgement, and that, that carried some, some, some weight. Um, so, uh, you know, were, were, were there mistakes that were made, certainly in that time, during Reagan and, 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 and Bush, um, I mean, I'm open to the criticisms. I, I do think that the idea that Ronald Reagan or George H.W. Bush of that generation um, were racist or that the Republican Party was fundamentally or significantly racist at the time, I'm not convinced of that. I certainly didn't see it in terms of my own interactions at the, at the time. The people that I worked with, the people I spent time with, um, I'd never encountered that I can recall anybody that I considered racist. And in fact, when I worked for William, William Bennett uh, in, in the late 80s as a speechwriter at the Department of Education, my favorite speech that Bill Bennett ever gave was a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I was in Martin Luther King Jr. in the liberal arts, I, I think. But King was, was one of the three figures that really fascinated Bennett in American history. Lincoln and Madison were, were two, of the, two of the other ones. So at least in, in the circles that I ran uh, around, the idea of, of, of racism was abhorrent and there was an effort to try and get the Republican Party on the right side of that question. Um, and uh, you know whether that had to do with Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, uh, there was more resistance in it in the Republican Party than there should have been, but Reagan ended up signing, signing the, uh, the legis legislation. Um, no party, no president is perfect, um, and, uh, and I'm sure there were mistakes, but I do think that taken in the totality of, of, of their acts, um, the Republican Party was, was, was pretty impressive and has a pretty good record um, during those years of, of, of Reagan and George H.W. Bush. I asked Wayne whether he thinks that the 21st century Republican Party of Donald Trump remains a conservative party. Or has populism essentially replaced conservatism in mainstream Republican politics? Yeah, I, I would say that 
now in, in, in the third decade of the 20th century, uh, the main political story as it relates to the Republican Party is that uh, the Republican Party today in the era of Donald Trump is, I'd say, increasingly fundamentally anti-democratic. I think it's a diseased and a d dangerous party. Um, and I think as a, uh, on a second tier, if you were thinking of concentric circles, I think that's the most important concentric circle that we're talking about, but probably one concentric circle outside of that is the way that the Republican Party has moved away from being a conservative party to being a populist, ethnic nationalist um, party. Uh, and that these, you know, the, the thing that really worried the founders, may have worried them more than anything else, was mob mentality. Uh, the reason that we have the system of government that we do with uh, the uh, checks and balances and separation of powers is precisely to try and calm the passions uh, because the founders were acutely aware of the dangers of a demagogue uh, taking, taking power and, and uh, wanting to have a check on that power. And, and I think actually the wisdom of the founders was validated during the Trump years uh, when, when our separation of powers, I think, kept some things that would have been awful uh, had they happened from, from happening, especially I, thought, I think the courts during the Trump years held up pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well. But yeah, the, the Republican Party today is... Uh, is, is not a conservative party. I think it's in many ways it's, it's an enemy of conservatism and it's an enemy of constitutionalism. And uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, I think this is now a generational change that's, uh, that's happening. And I'd say that Donald Trump's imprint on the Republican Party is at least comparable to what Ronald Reagan's imprint on the Republican Party uh, was. And, and that's saying something. Given Donald Trump's obsession with good and evil, I asked Weiner whether he thinks that Trump has too much morality or not enough. I'd say that the problem with Trump's Republican Party is, is, is it's, uh, it is an enemy of morality. Um, and I think also it's a battering ram against truth. I think there's an epistemological crisis in America that's being driven uh, in large measure by, by the Republican Party, the MAGA world as, as, as it's referred to, and Donald Trump him, himself. Um, but look, Donald Trump is, is himself a man who's both amoral and immoral. A amoral in the sense that I, I think he's a, he, he is uh, a, a, a clinical case, a sociopath. I don't think he's a person who has um, a moral conscience or can see morality or even understands things th through morality. I think morality is, is to trump what color is to a person who's colorblind. Uh, but then I think he's immoral too in the sense that he uses his power and influence over people to hurt them and to do bad things, to do illegal things, to do lawless things. That's now a matter of record. It's not, it's not speculation. Uh, and uh, so Donald Trump himself is amoral and immoral. Uh, then the, I think the real indictment of the Republican Party is that people who know better, who know what Trump is about, you, who used to stand for different things, or at least said they stood for different things, um, have rallied around him, looked the other way, um, got sort of voce at, 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 at sometimes, but for the most part has, has defended him and, and, and uh, been, his, been his champion. So I think the Republican Party today is, is, is complicit in the immorality of Trump and the immorality of, of, uh, uh, of, his, of his presidency and his, um, and his, his uh, agenda. Uh, you know, I, I, I grant you that elements of the American right can be moralistic um, and obsessive on, on, on certain issues, including culture war issues. But I think that the way that they use morality is so transparently cynical um, that I, I, don't, I don't consider it too moral. I consider it a deformation of morality in any gen serious, serious sense. I asked Wayno what he thinks he brings as a prominent conservative critic of Trump and Trumpism. Yeah, I, I think what probably um, defines or at least characterizes my work as it relates to Trump in this political moment is that, the, is that I'm writing about it through a certain kind of lens, a moral lens. Um, I think that's just been 
part of who I've been uh, since I've been a young person. And, um, and morality and questions of morality and moral integrity have just been important uh, in my life. And, and when I think about the people whom I've admired throughout my life, people that I wanted to model myself after, um, I think it was almost always a sense of kind of moral virtues. I mean, I don't really remember having, um, you know, desires to model myself after people who were wealthy or, um, or other things. I, I think, you know, the quality of a person's life in terms of their integrity just has always had resonance with, with me. Um, so I think that's just shaped and, and it's really, a, I'm a product of people who've invested in me and loved me and helped shape those, those moral sentiments. Uh, however imperfectly I, I represent them and, and, and see through that prism. So I think there's no question that I, I felt, uh, Andrew, almost instantaneously Trump was trouble. Uh, the first piece that I wrote critical of Trump was actually in 2011 in the Wall Street Journal. There's a piece called The GOP and the Birther Trap. That was when, when um, Trump was peddling this racist conspiracy theory that Barack Obama was not an American citizen. And I was warning Republicans, don't play footsie with this guy. This is conspiracy theory. This is ugly. And you're going to pay a price for it if you do. And then when he got into the race, which was in June of 2015, I had a piece in the New York Times within three weeks warning Republicans in the country at large about what the threat that I, that I saw in Donald Trump. Uh, and I, I would say that the thing, there are a lot of things that really trouble me about Trump. I think the thing where I feel most animated and get uh, most upset is when I see these instances of Donald Trump using his power to hurt people over whom he has power. The gratuitous use of power, of the gratuitous uh, use of power uh, toward, toward cruelty uh, and toward, uh, toward vengeance um, and just hurting people, uh, hurting them through words, hurting them through deeds. You know, I, I remember, just for example, when he got up and he, um, mocked a New York Times reporter uh, who uh, was, uh, had, had physical handicaps. And that really, really bothered me. And so these attacks on people uh, who are more vulnerable um, really uh, uh, upset me. And it was to me one window, and there's so many different windows into, into who Donald Trump was in some fundamental, fundamental way. Um, so I, I, I'd say that that's pretty high up on the, uh, on the list. I, I would also say as a lifelong conservative to see what he's done to conservatism and how he's pried apart the Republican Party from the best traditions, its own best traditions and also the best traditions of conservatism has, has, uh, has troubled me as, as, as well. And I imagine there's some element of having been a lifelong Republican you know, to some extent, having given my life to the Republican Party um, and now seeing what it's been turned into, maybe there's some some feelings of of shame and, and embarrassment sense that, you know, should I have been more aware than I was of what was happening? Um, and, but in any event, however, that that plays itself out, however accurate it is, uh, a party that I had been a part of uh, and, and, and devoted a lot of my life to is, is now uh, a, a, an instrument to attack the Constitution, morality, uh, our laws, uh, and to tear our country apart. And so I think that probably explains in part why I've been as vocal as I have in, um, in this moment. If Donald Trump is president of the United States in 2026, when the country celebrates its 250th year anniversary, then what? I asked Wayne. How would this look to the outside world? President in 2026, when America celebrates its 250th anniversary, it's going to be uh, a very dark uh, and, uh, and depressing uh, and alarming uh, anniversary. Uh, because America will have as president a man who's 
sociopathic and authoritarian and a, an enemy of the best ideals of America. And I have no question that if he's president in 2026, when America celebrates its 250th birthday, he's going to uh, be attacking the institutions and the values that, um, that have uh, uh, most honored America and represented the best um, of America. So uh, if that's the case, I think we will be in the midst of a titanic struggle, an enormous drama without a clear denouement. We won't know how it's going to end. Um, I don't have any doubt that if Donald Trump is president, there's nothing he won't try to do. Uh, I'd, 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 I'd bet my bottom dollar that, that there's no line that he, won't, that he won't cross. So the question then becomes whether the institutions of America are strong enough to resist his, his assaults and the assaults of, of his administration. Uh, it's an open question. Uh, I mean, we dodged that bullet once before, but there was considerable damage. And we know now from what happened, the records, the history of what happened on January 6th, uh, you know, that it was a closer call than we realized. And that if a few key individuals had gone one way instead of another, um, things could have, could have gone a lot worse than they, than they, than they were. And they were bad enough uh, for, for, uh, for sure. But, you know, if Donald Trump is president when, we're, when America is celebrating its 250th uh, birthday, we Americans, if they're celebrating what is authentically best about America, uh, will be celebrating an America that, that is contrary to everything that Donald Trump stands for and, uh, and embodies. So it, it, it would be uh, a, 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 a 250th uh, anniversary uh, would involve a lot of cognitive dissonance uh, if Donald Trump is uh, is is president, um, because we would uh, we we might want to celebrate the best of America, but we would have as president the worst of America. Finally, I asked Peter Weiner what he thinks Americans should be celebrating in 2026, and how the country can make itself a more perfect union in the future. I think the thing that America should celebrate uh, at its 250th birthday uh, is first and foremost what America brought to the world, which is the concept of, of all human beings created equal. Um, the execution of that's been flawed for sure in America as it's been in, in, in all countries. But that was a revolutionary concept and that, that notion of uh, inherent human dignity, human rights, um, it was a profound one and it reshaped the world and I think it reshaped the world for the better. And that's something to take authentic pride and satisfaction in. Uh, second thing is I think that, you know, for an anniversary, a celebration of 250 years, of course you want to you uh, um, focus in on, on, on the great figures and the great moments in American history of progress toward toward justice, uh, whether it was the founding or, or the abolition movement, or the civil rights movement, enormous breakthroughs in, in, in social uh, policy, um, efforts at equality, America's involvement in World War II um, in, in, as, as one of the allied powers withstanding um, the, the, the Nazis and, and, and Mussolini and, and the Japanese empire. Um, and I think overall, America, it's fair to say, has been a, a, a beacon uh, to, to the world. Um, an imperfect one for sure, but generally speaking, I think in the totality of its acts, a very impressive, uh, impressive country. But you also have to take into account those dark chapters, which, which are very real. And in terms of going forward, where we want to be in the next 50 or 100, 100 years, um, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the language of Barack Obama, which is, you know, uh, that America is, is an imperfect union and striving toward, toward greater justice with, within the context of an imperfect union is a pretty good way to think, think about it. You just need to take more and more steps toward, um, toward justice, uh, I hope toward, toward civic and social healing, uh, toward in, uh, inclusion. Uh, toward, toward compassion, toward moral order and moral sanity. Um, and I hope that America can um, use its power 
uh, to advance uh, moral ends and to help advance human dignity at home and, uh, and abroad. We won't get it right all the time for sure, uh, but if we can get it right often enough, especially at the key moments on the key questions, that would, um, that would be a pretty good record and something to be proud of.